Welcome everyone to Chapter 1 of the Wealth Management Essentials course. My name is Jacob Tompkins and I'm currently an Associate Advisor in Woodstock, New Brunswick. I have been studying for the Wealth Management Essentials exam and decided to make these videos as a way to help others study for the exam as well and to review all the important material for myself. I will be creating a playlist with all 23 chapters from the WME course. Each chapter consists of some of the more important concepts, and the videos should be seen uh, more as a high-level overview of the chapters. If you have any questions about anything in the chapter, just leave a comment and I will try to respond when I can. I hope you find the reviews helpful, and with that said, let's start with chapter one, which is all about wealth management. So in this chapter, there are eight different learning objectives that I will go through. We will discuss the current situation with wealth management in Canada, as well as the different services. I'll touch on some of the key trends, the regulatory environment, some competencies of a successful wealth advisor, the wealth management process, and of course, how advisors can work with a team of specialists. So we're going to start off by uh, defining wealth management. So wealth management, it is an approach to managing the affairs of clients holding significant assets. As a wealth management professional, it is your job to help advise and help manage the assets of your clients. In Canada, there are a variety of different wealth segments. Most of the wealth in Canada is actually held by high net worth individuals who are individuals or families that own at least $1 million of investable assets. As you can see, the wealth distribution of Canadian households has been changing in the past 10 years. You now have many baby boomers retiring, which has impacted the number of high net worth households. The changing nature of the high net worth demographic has helped shape the wealth management industry's offerings, and these changes have resulted in a broader market for wealth management. Also, a wider range of services available and a deeper advisory relationship with clients. Over the past few decades, the wealth management industry has become much more competitive in terms of things being provided to clients, especially the high net worth clients. To provide a full range of services, wealth advisors call on specialists in related fields, including risk management, investment management, tax planning, and estate planning. Wealth advisors integrate the recommendations of these experts into a coherent wealth plan tailored to meet their clients' needs. Next, we're going to look at some different types of wealth management channels. So there are three different wealth management channels in Canada. First off, you have private wealth management. So the services consist of private banking, investment counsel, and personal trust services. They're quite often offered by banks or other deposit-taking organizations. So if you do think of uh, some real-life examples, uh, you could think of maybe RBC Wealth Management. They do have their banking sector, investment council, and trust services, and they sort of brand it as RBC Wealth Management. So that is a wealth management company. You also have a full-service brokerage. So the full service brokerage channel is dominated by the large bank owned dealers, which increasingly focus their product and service offerings on the high net worth segment. So a real life example could be RBC Dominion Securities, Gosha McLeod, Nesbitt Burns. A lot of independent advisors can also be considered full service brokerages um, because they do offer not only the investment management, but also some wealth management as well. Private Investment Council, uh, so these are monoline firms offering only investment management. There are some independent advisors that only focus on investments. You can also think of maybe uh, just working with a local bank. Some people might invest there and they're only getting help with their investments. They're not actually with RBC Wealth Management or Dominion Securities, they're just at their local bank uh, investing a few thousand dollars. There's also what's called fully integrated firms uh, within private wealth management. So this includes the major banks and some other large financial institutions that offer a comprehensive range of private wealth services. 
So again, you can think of RBC Wealth Management or some other large financial institution. They offer a variety of different services to the clients. You can see credit and treasury products, discretionary investment management, trusts, estate planning, all of that. You also have semi-integrated firms, which is the full service brokerage. Uh, and again, um, these offer a limited range of high net worth services. So they do offer the investment management, but also some other things as well. Uh, could be estate planning, financial planning, things like that. And it is estimated that 78% of high net worth households have a relationship with at least one full service brokerage. To attract high net worth clients, full service brokerages, they have been developing in-house capabilities and, the, and they have leveraged this expertise of other divisions within the companies. So you can see some, uh, some companies branding to, um, well, Manulife, uh, for example, is branding to Manulife Wealth rather than Manulife Securities. They're trying to distinguish um, themselves that they do offer these other services. So again, just some more information on the Private Investment Council. Uh, so they do usually offer just investment management. You can uh, think of maybe just some small independent regional offices. Um, they, they also include large asset management firms with a national focus as well, uh, but they really only focus on the investment management. So an example would be investing directly with a bank branch as they only provide investment management or sometimes with some independent advisors that only manage investments. Now we're going to look at some key trends impacting the wealth management industry. So the industry is always changing as the population ages and technology continues to evolve. Changes in the wealth management industry in Canada can be discussed generally in terms of uh, four roughly defined demographic segments in the adult population, being the silent generation, baby boomers, Gen X, and millennials. In Canada, at least two of every three high net worth households are led by either baby boomers or people from preceding generations meaning that most of the wealth in Canada is held by people age 55 or older. This makes sense because generally at that age, people have the most time to pay off debt. They have saved and accumulated a wealth, and they are starting to approach the years where they're going to be retired and uh, living off of that wealth. As a wealth management advisor, it is important to become transition specialists by helping those clients understand the major issues they will face later in life. It could be going through retirement. It could be dealing with estates, estate planning. Um, so it is important for a wealth advisor to understand those things and be able to communicate that with the client and help them with uh, those new segments of their life. Now with the shift to more high net worth clients in Canada, the competitive pressures have been increasing. Um, so there has been a lot more competition between channels and competitive pricing. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, that between the three different wealth management channels, which we went over, private wealth management, full service brokerage, and the private investment council, they are becoming more competitive by offering similar products and services. They're also offering more competitive pricing. So concerns over MERs, management expense ratios, um, with mutual funds have encouraged some clients to move towards ETFs. Um, and there have been some firms trying to be competitive on their fees uh, just as a competitive advantage for the client. Also, along with these changes, there has been quite a few technological changes as well. Uh, you have robo-advisors, uh, which help online investors create their own customized portfolio to save for specific goals. Um, and the investments typically used within these portfolios are low-cost ETFs. So they're usually just, you can think of them as index funds. You're just buying into the market with a low uh, management fee. And this typically appeals to younger fee-conscious investors who have smaller amounts to invest and are comp with the online technology and prefer that self-service model. Another technological change is cryptocurrencies. So they have became popular within the last decade. 
Um, basically, they're a decentralized form of digital cash that eliminates the need for intermediaries such as banks and governments to make financial transactions. So the introduction of cryptocurrencies have created new rules and regulations in the industry around volatility, transparency, valuation, and liquidity. Um, it's also been seen as a new asset class. So sometimes people have been uh, investing maybe 5 or 10% of their money in cryptocurrency just as a uh, diversifier. And you're even seeing some new cryptocurrency funds uh, starting to be available now as well. We will talk more about uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular in a later chapter. Artificial intelligence has been especially popular this year um, with things like ChatGPT becoming uh, sort of mainstream. Um, but AI, it has uh, sort of evolved the uh, securities industry as well by allowing businesses to select the best stocks and other assets in the financial markets. Wealth management also has a wider scope of AI applications uh, in areas such as tax planning, estate planning, and other financial planning. Uh, so all these applications allow advisors to build better financial plans just with a greater degree of efficiency and customization. Now uh, just talking a bit about the regulatory environment. So you have banks. Uh, banks are regulated under the Bank Act. So it is the federal government that is responsible for the regulation of the banking sector. However, some bank activities carried out by the uh, subsidiaries, uh, such as trustee services and securities dealing, they are provincially regulated. Credit unions, uh, such as uh, Desjardins Group and, and other credit unions in Canada, they are provincially incorporated, so they're uh, they have to follow provincial laws. Then you have insurance companies, which is generally uh, a federal thing, so it's governed by the Government of Canada, and they regulate that under the life and health insurance sector of the Insurance Companies Act. Provinces have the power to ensure that federally incorporated insurance companies conducting business in their respective jurisdictions are financially sound. There are also trust and loan companies, and uh, they can be regulated by both levels of government, so federal and provincial. Uh, market conduct is regulated at the provincial level, but the Government of Canada regulates federally incorporated companies under the uh, Trust and Loan Companies Act. That's just a little bit about the uh, regulatory environment and who is regulating who. Uh, you also have um, mutual fund companies. They're uh, typically regulated under MFDA, which is the Mutual Fund Dealers Association of Canada. Recently, they have merged with IROC, which is actually the uh, securities dealer um, regulatory body. And so they merged into uh, CERO. But essentially, that regulatory body, which is now CERO, it is responsible for regulating all sales of mutual funds in most of Canada. Um, and as an SRO, uh, they are responsible for regulating the operations, standards uh, of practice, and business conduct of its members. You also have the securities dealers. So this would be if you're buying equities, or stocks, or, or bonds, or things like that. Um, and uh, they're administered by the Canadian Securities Administrators, the CSA, which brings together securities regulators from all 10 provinces. So each province has their own um, governing body that uh, regulates uh, the securities industry. And the CSA just brings them together to help coordinate and harmonize provincial regulations of the security industry within uh, the markets. Another key part of the chapter was just some competencies of a successful wealth advisor. A lot of these are fairly common sense, um, but the, we'll just go over them. Some technical competencies include uh, assisting clients in growing, protecting, and monetizing a closely held business. So if you have a business owner that's a client, um, just helping them um, around that. Also establish and facilitate tax efficient wealth accumulation and management strategies um, that help them with their life goals. That's a really important part. Using advanced risk management techniques to create an optimal 
personalized and integrated wealth preservation plan. Collaborate with clients to optimize the conversion of assets into income uh, in retirement. Develop and implement a wealth transfer plan that reflects the wishes of the client and the needs of the family. You also have some professional practice competencies, including build and manage client relationships, usually by gaining trust. Evaluate client needs, goals, and behavioral biases and link them to recommendations leading to a comprehensive wealth management plan and uh, coordinate and engage a trusted team of experts and custom business marketing techniques. So the wealth management process essentially starts with understanding the client. So you need to build the relationship with the client uh, by gaining trust. Um, and then you want to gather the quantitative and the qualitative data. So you want to know their financial information, but also their goals uh, in life as well because you wanna match them with the recommendations that you are going to be providing. You also wanna determine the client's needs, objectives, and constraints when it comes to the investments. So you might, uh, might need to figure out, uh, well, some investors might wanna invest in ESG funds. That might be a constraint that you want, they wanna put on their account. They don't wanna invest in a certain area. Um, some clients have, uh, maybe they have a need, they kinda of need to have, earn a higher rate of return uh, to reach their goals. And so maybe you want to talk to them about leaning more into the markets and how, and how that will affect their portfolio and the volatility around that. And then finally, just educating your clients on how the markets work, how investments work. That's another uh, important part of the process. Um, it does help build trust as well. With that, you will start formulating the plan. So it could be uh, you put it together in a retirement plan or you create uh, in, an investment um, recommendation and figure out the best uh, asset allocation for that client. You then implement the plan. And finally, you report and review the plan and of course, rebalance it um, when needed. It has also become quite important in the wealth management industry to build a team of specialists. So quite often securities dealers, they have built uh, some sort of uh, structure with a lot of different specialists that the advisor can access. So you don't need to be a specialist in every area, but it is up to you to build and manage an expert team that will complement and enhance all of the knowledge and skills you offer to your clients. So quite often these securities dealers, they will have some experts in tax planning, uh, maybe risk management, trust preparation, legal issues, uh, state planning, retirement planning, etc. So it is helpful to be able to uh, capitalize the, on that and um, take advantage of it for your client. And finally, we'll bring it back to the learning objectives. So. Uh, basically, if you go through each of the eight learning objectives, you should be able to sort of think of uh, some answers to each of those questions based on the information that we went over. I really hope you all found chapter one helpful. If you have any questions about the chapter, just comment them in the comments down below and I'll try to answer when possible. And I will see you all in chapter two.